what do you mean? Three weeks? It's only 2,700 magnets. Like, how long could that possibly take to ship? Well, yes, and the... No, I can't tell you. Oh, hello. Welcome to Office Hours, the live sector of the facility where good old Professor Kyle opens up his blast doors, not, not in that way, to take all of your comments, questions, uh, and comments about my hair and face off the top of my head to try to answer them in an entertaining and educational way. Consider me your own personal science boy. Again, not in that way. As we usually do, we will be going through your comments live. We'll also be talking about a number of topics this week, five topics to be uh, very specific. Topics that I've seen throughout the last, uh, since the last office hours that have intrigued me or something that I think you will enjoy and we will get to them promptly. We also have the live chat open and super chat so if you really, really, really want me to see something, you can do a super chat and I will do my very best to get to it and to read it like from Jay Arrows with a $99 donation from even before I started who's simping. For science. Second time catching office hours, Kyle just got certified as an x-ray technician, hoping another x-ray video, uh, or could you not do that because it would be pulling from old material? Bone shadow where... <laughs> no, Jay, we can do another x-ray episode. No one's got a trademark on x-ray science videos. We can do whatever. We also have... Uh, we also have 25 from Elizabeth Calvert, longtime supporter of mine. Bum that I'm gonna miss the live stream. Damn, I need to earn my money, but I will use some to simp for science. Thank you, Kyle, for being awesome. See, it's just that easy. All, all your super chats go straight back into simping for science, and today we're going to be simping about some interesting topics. The first topic, of course, did a physics student solve the biggest paradox for backwards time travel? Maybe? It's a very complicated paper, but we will go through it as best I can. We'll also be giving you an update on the basilisk and how people in the outside world, outside of these very thick walls, are handling the basilisk. We'll be talking about floating upside down on levitating water. It's some of the coolest footage that I've seen in a long time, and, and, uh, and I want to go through some of that physics with you. Uh, we'll be taking one of your comments from the last episode of the facility about uranium and cloud chambers, and finally, we'll be talking about... I can't not see just a sad boy. Just a sad... F Wait, I'll try to... Uh, sad Mars. But uh, there was a recent study uh, just a couple of days ago that we may have found more liquid water on Mars. So, of course, we'll be going through all of that. But before we get to that, let's pause the Super Chats so we can get to our first topic. You can do it afterwards. Oh, simpin ain't easy. I know it is. Is that okay to appropriate that? So, here we have a classic depiction of a wormhole. If I was a science professor in a movie, I would take a sheet of paper and put a pencil through it. <laughs> but this is a classic uh, generalized representation, visual representation of a wormhole. And uh, what it's showing is two areas in space-time two locations in space-time connected by some sort of throat. Like, I know, it's all kind of weird. Uh, a wormhole throat as a gateway to another place in space-time that you would not be able to get to if you were obeying the speed of light. So what I'm saying here is that typically you need to travel, if you want to travel from here to here, you must follow the curvature of space-time, and the only way to do that, the maximum speed you could do that, is at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. But if you use something like a wormhole, you can, instead of going all this distance, you can go this distance. And if you go a distance in a, sh if you go some distance in a shorter amount of time than the speed of light would dictate, you are traveling faster than light between two points in space without breaking any laws. That's why uh, wormholes are so attractive and so popular in sci-fi stories. But what was this paper trying to get at? Well, the paper was titled Reversible Dynamics with Closed Time-Like Curves and Freedom of Choice. So the biggest... So the biggest paradox that um, serves as a barrier to backwards time travel, we can... Uh, aside, uh, we can travel forwards in time 
we're doing that right now, but you can travel quick, more quickly through time than is normal time, and that's if you go really, really fast. But that's not what we're talking about. Everyone wants to travel backwards in time to do something. The biggest barrier to that is the grandfather paradox, and there's a number of different names for it. Um, but given this paradox, many physicists will say, because of this paradox, it can't happen. Because it would be logically inconsistent with how the universe works and causality. A causes B, causes C, etc. So if you're not familiar, the, grand, the grandfather paradox would be if, well, what if me right now, what if I went back in time and then I shot my grandfather? Therefore, I would never exist in the future to go back to the past. But then how did I get back to the past to eliminate my future in the first? So the, the causality breaks down there, and that's the grandfather paradox. Oh, make a wish. That's, that's, that's no way to think logically. So that the grandfather paradox is one of the, the large paradoxes that uh, physicists will hold up and say, eh, I can't travel backwards in time. So this paper uh, is looking at, okay, well, is there a way to avoid the paradox while going backwards in time, period? <laughs> and how they want to do that is what is generally called in physics circles, or physics spheres, they'd probably call themselves, nerds. Closed time-like curves, or CTCs for short. Um, and a time-like curve is a pathway through space-time, a world line, that is uh, consistent with staying inside of your light cone. That is to say, every, where you are traveling... Uh, where you are traveling through space and time, it's not violating it's not violating the speed of light. And you're not going outside of your light cone to interact with, with events that you could never interact with if you were obeying the speed of light. If you're a space-like curve, then that's a problem. But if you're a time-like curve, you stay inside of your light cone. And if you want to know more about light cones, you can, uh, you can look them up or you can look at some of my uh, recent videos. I think black hole, the black hole video, I think we went through it a little bit. Anyway, um, but that's a closed time-like curve. It's a, clo it's a closed time-like curve because it's almost like a loop. So if you were to... Visual aids. No. So if you were to imagine a world line, say it's my finger, and going camera right... Yeah. Going camera right is into the future. Going camera left is into the past here. So you travel along this world line from the past to the future. But if you were to make a loop here, like a little loop standing up, past, future, and then you take the loop back to the past. And all the while you are traveling um, along some world line that doesn't violate physics. Uh, you can do this by theoretically traveling faster than light, but we can't do this. Or you could do this with something like a wormhole, where if two ends of a wormhole um, are in different regions of space-time and one, say, um, is younger, one mouth is younger than the other. Again, this all sounds weird when you say it. If one mouth of the wormhole is younger than the other, time synchronizes through the throat of the wormhole, and if you enter, if you enter in your time, you can exit in the past. It gets very complicated. But suffice it to say, you can time travel with a wormhole theoretically back to the past. Okay. So we have that. But the grandfather paradox is still there. So how do we get around it? Well, the paper in question had a number of very useful diagrams. And keep in mind, I am not a theoretical physicist, and these papers are hella complicated. So I'm going to do my best. Each one of these little uh, Michael Bublé's here represents some region of space-time that you could occupy. Um, and they are distinct from each other. So them being distinct from each other means that obeying the speed of light, they couldn't interact with each other. So they're too far away, for example. And what, sh what it's showing is a world line path. So A1, A2, AN. And this world line path is showing that if it's going from past to the future, if you're in this region of space-time, 
as events progress, you can interact with that world line. You could do something to it. That's what F stands for, a function. You, 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 uh, you have an input, you do something to the time, do something to the events, and then there's an output. X. Now, what's interesting here is that all of these, what the paper is really getting at, is that all of these world lines using something like a wormhole are going from the future and then all the way over to the W there back to the past. So these are all closed time-like curves. How this is getting around the grandfather paradox, for example, is that W over there. So that's another region in space-time where once you approach it, something happens, some W function, and that would allow you to continue traveling back to your own A1 past without any paradox occurring. I know, this is heavy. But they, they have another diagram that shows kind of the same thing. So if you had a wormhole in the future with a young mouth, ugh. <laughs> you have a close, imagine a closed time-like curve coming into and out of your screen here. So you're traveling on the world line, it goes whoop, and you appear back in the past. So on that world line, events are happening in the future, you go back to the past, you can interact with them in your little region of space-time, but all of these events have something, some function W, that occurs later on. Now why is that important? Well, the paper uses this example. So imagine that you wanted to go back in time and prevent the first case of COVID-19 from occurring. I don't know, maybe you just shove the guy in like a bubble. <laughs> no time to explain! Or you kill him, I don't know. Uh, so say you wanted to do that. The normal grandfather paradox would say, well, you can't do that because if you go back and prevent COVID-19 from happening, how, <coughs> How in the future is COVID-19 happening and then causing you to go from the future back into the past to prevent it from happening? You can't prevent something from happening that hasn't happened if it's going to happen. <laughs> okay. That was very clear. Now, their solution to this is this W. And this W is a nebulous idea that is basically saying this. Well, you can avoid the grandfather paradox if something in the universe recalibrates all the events around what you do in the past to make the future consistent. So one thing that's difficult to understand about closed time like curves is that if everything is on the loop, if there's a past, there's a future, and you have everything in the loop. Everything is on the same world line. And if we're, you know, fifth dimensional being looking at this space and time all as one, all of these events happened. All of these events have happened. This is what is going to happen. The, the, the events are set. What this is saying is that no matter what, if you have some, if, if something in the universe will try to correct for this paradox, then no matter what you, if you can travel back to the past, you can change stuff, but you will not ultimately alter what the future is. And so in this COVID-19 example, you might push the guy who's patient zero into a bubble, but when you push him, he sneezes into your mouth and then you get it and then you're patient zero. So events in the past have changed, but the future remains unchanged. You see the little, this is very nuanced here. There, there's, it's the wiggle room. It's saying no matter what you do in the past, kind of like, this is like, like a Final Destination movie or, uh, you know, a, a, a recalibration of the butterfly effect. No matter what you do, some knock-on effect, some Rube Goldbergian kind of uh, cosmic process will make it so the future still happens in the same way. So again, in this example, you could go back in time, prevent patient zero, oops, now you're patient zero, you cause COVID-19, and then you wanna go back in the past to prevent that from happening. 
okay? So in the outlets that I saw bring this up, they're saying that this solves the time travel paradox. And again, I'm not a theoretical physicist, but unless I'm missing something here, this W function and just saying that there could be events in the universe that recalibrate themselves to make the future immutable. That sounds like one of these, a reach. There, there's a problem with mathematical constructions like this in practica. I don't know if that's an actual thing that you can say, but I'm saying it now, and you should say it. In practica, a wormhole needs like negative exotic matter at the smallest scales of the universe to hold a, one of the wormholes open for even a few nanoseconds. Like, it's only mathematically possible as far as we know, and it requires stuff that we have no idea what it is. This seems similar to me in that, well, yeah, there's some mathematical logical construction where you could avoid the grandfather paradox, but it requires the universe to recalibrate events around you, and it would do that some way so unless i'm really missing something this is a very interesting mathematical construction and logical um solution using cool physics like wormholes and stuff and ctcs but i don't know if this is true like would the universe have a have a recalibration function like this would it actually do that is that how the universe actually works I don't think the paper speaks to that at all. So, I don't think anything was solved here, although you can prove this mathematically and logically works, but in practica, does it work? It's like the baby centrifuge. So, that's what I have to say about that. And that's the way the news goes. We have QC with the 15 who says, Hey Kyle, nice hair by the way. <laughs> what, this? Also, is it fate or determinism, but give, is this fate or determinism given a scientific lens? It seems like it's an argument for CTCs not really being paradoxical. I like it. Yes, this is hard, this is hard determinism. So uh, it's, it's more like wiggle room determin determinism where the conclusions aren't changed, but the events leading up to them may be. Um, well, I guess it's not hard to determine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because everything in the loop would be consistent, no matter what happens, if it's possible. So yes, you're absolutely right. Sarah McFalls with the 20, who says, first time catching you live. Thanks for helping me be the auntie that knows, quote, everything during my stint as a COVID substitute teacher. Nothing is better than engaging eight-year-olds in STEM. Sarah, thank you so much. Um, please tell your nieces and or nephews that Kyle says hello, and I love, um, I'm, I'm, humbled and honored to help you teach them during these trying times uh we have 10 from tyler koch who says howdy ho hill doggo no we're not gonna we're not gonna make that a thing how about a segment on mass types to educate us viewers on which are most effective what's your opinion on the environmental effects of so many disposable masks um so we got a lot of who oh, we got a lot of simpers but uh the quick answer is that Basically, the higher thread count, the more effective your mask is going to be. So a bandana is not as good as heavy cloth is not as good as surgical masks, more or less. Uh, Joshua Barbeau with the Canada 20 he says, Hey Kyle, so glad I could be here live. I missed the last few because of work. Do you think that we haven't figured out how time travel works yet? Because the mouth is covered with a giant COVID mask? Wear your mask, peeps. Oh, classic. We have frequent commenter and supporter grin reaper of trolls with a 19 who says and where did that bring you back to me i'm inevitable also this kind of reminds me of the powers of kill a queen and king crimson yeah this is a thanos situation was thanos right talk among yourselves we have casey miller with a 15 and nothing attached to it that's classy that's just class right there we also have the 50 from breadboard uh do you also frequently uh, donate to Dr. Disrespect? Because I, I hear your name all the time. With the 50, it says, Kyle, your hair, your hair me quantum foaming from my young mouth. All simp, no science. <laughs> you do this every week. Stop making things dirty. There's nothing about physics that's dirty. It's all clean. No air resistance. Everything's a sphere. No dirt. Rachel Newton-John, 
Uh, it says, hey, Aria, love the show. How dare you? Have some sweet, sweet student loan money. Blech. Hey, Kyle, I still want my plaque. I, I'm working on it, aren't we? But don't spend your student loan money on me. <laughs> Mike Benavides with the 10 says, I live in Lake Charles, uh, Louisiana, and still recovering from Hurricane Laura. Can you shed some light on the devastation of a Category 5 for those that are unaware love the show? Um, I actually don't know a whole lot about the... Is, is um, Are Category 5s like uh, Richter scales in that they're logarithmic? In that a, pow a 4 is 10 times more powerful than a 3, but 100 more, 100 more times powerful than a 2? I don't know. See, you can teach me this. Um, but a Category 5 with sustained winds in the hundreds of miles per hour is incredibly devastating because... So, during my time as an engineer, and if you go into engineering, you'll learn this. I mean, most buildings are not specced to handle wind loading, wind shear, just pushing from the wind. That That is from something that is not a regular occurrence. So, for example, if you're... Let's pause the Super Chats for a second so we can get to the next topic, but... Um, if, if something isn't regular, oh, sorry. So for example, uh, in a snowy place, you have to account when you're building a house's roof for dead loading of snow or else once a year for a couple of months, a lot of buildings might fail. But in a place like Los Angeles, you do not have to build roofs like that. So people will build to code for wind shear. If you have a tall building, wind loading, side loading, by which I mean shear. Um, if you're in a windy area, people will build for that. But if it's a Category 5 hurricane that is like a once-in-a-10-year, once-in-a-20-year thing, or is becoming more, uh, is very unlikely, but it's becoming more frequent because of climate change, there's a lot of buildings and a lot of areas that are likely not specced to handle that kind of, uh, of wind load. So Category 5 could be incredibly damaging. I mean, you saw this, um... You see this on in island nations, areas that aren't uh, as affluent, buildings aren't up to code. When you're not specced to handle, quote-unquote, freak accidents or freak events, uh, force force majeure, as they called in, in the legal world, then devastation can be total. Uh, Santiago Ardia with the 20,000 COP. I'm going to guess that, that that's not $20,000, or else I'm going to shut down the stream right now, and then I... I'm, I do you know the best way to light a chimney? Uh, you should probably... Let's pause the Super Chats. I don't want to miss anyone. Hot take. <laughs> you should stop burning wood in your fireplace. Um, it is easily... We have the data on this now. The, the particulate and pollution that you put in the air from wood-burning stoves and fireplaces literally causes thousands and thousands of deaths a year from knock-on health effects. Um... You can, you can get as granular as, you know, children near places that burn a lot of wood have lower test scores kind of thing. Um, so even though it, it, it fe it's nice, and I liked it when I was a kid, it's nice to sit by a campfire, etc. It's nice, it's warm, it's calming, you have your family around it, it's great. It's, it's a real public health hazard, and we have the data. And if we can remove our emotions from that data... We can see that it's actually harmful, and so I would advocate for you to not light your chimney, as a matter of fact. <laughs> then, what do I know? I don't get anywhere near fires. This would go up like crazy. Volderoth with the 10, it says, First live, also simping, also science simping is easy. Well, maybe for you. Oh. Yeah, maybe for you. <laughs> I thought I had someone else to say. Chris Spaghetti, uh... With the 999, it says, Hey Kyle, I've seen some videos saying we can use electromagnets and a, a shaped in a donut filled with superfluid to have an anti-gravity effect, aka UFO propulsion sweet beard. Thank you, Chris Spaghetti. I love your dishes as well. That's very kind of you. Um, UFO propulsion, I don't know what people think that is, um, but I've never heard of the design for that kind of engine. Um... If aliens existed, they'd probably use something that's highly energy efficient and has a lot of thrust. And that's something like fusion or antimatter. Uh, antimatter engines would be the most efficient engines in the universe. Um, a, a toroid donut magnet 
arrangement is usually what we do in uh, experimental fusion reactors, but those are reactors. There's, they're not engineered to give the thrust, the pushing stuff that you want for something like an engine. So those designs are cool and there is some science there, but I do not think that that would be an alien engine. Uh, wow, a lot of people, whoa. Oh, what do we have? 3,000 people in the facility. That's a record. Thank you. Um, it TM Immortal, you know, I say that. Um, the more of you join me for things like this, I got some stuff cooking on the back burners, back behind me, uh, in the facility where we might be streaming a lot more with a lot more resources. So if you show some, any, some people who might be watching, we might be, oh... Ooh, professors, we might we might go to the big leagues. We'll see. Uh, sorry, I'm skipping some of you. I got to get to the next topic. Jean-Paul with the 10 pen who says, there was a movie called The Time Machine from 2002 that had the same idea as the paper. Yes, the MC built a time machine to save his fiance from getting killed, but she ended up dying from some other cause. Yep, that's exactly what we're ta talking about. Good eye. Uh, Vitriolin with the uh, A5. Don't know what that is, but I'm assuming it's good. Corey... Capehart with the 666 sign of the... I can't say. I don't want him showing up here again. Show Kyle, I love the... Ah, stop it! <laughs> Keep up the great work, man. It's awesome to see a show like yours. Notice me, senpai. Consider yourself notice. Don't gift that because it's time for our second topic. <laughs> oh! I'm so small. So I wanted to give everyone an update on the Basilisk because the Basilisk currently is the most viewed video on my channel. And um, in that video, in the first 30 seconds, I say, warning, some people get great mental distress from thinking about this idea. And I'd say 99% of you, as I figured, would be like, yeah, yeah it's fine. But this was the danger. This, is a, it, I, this wasn't just a throwaway line because I get emails like this from Anonymous. About a month ago, I came across your Roko Basilisk video and I wasn't feeling scared at the time. I've been really scared since and I have trouble sleeping and became depressed because of it. I heard you don't take it seriously and I just want to ex you to explain why. I just want to go back to before I've seen it because it's really interfering with my mental health and I should have known better before I decided to watch it. Now, I don't know if this is just trolling me or if this is serious, but I'm going to take it seriously because I take mental health seriously because mental health is health and you are nothing if not your mental processes, at least your, your conscious person. So if this isn't, you know, if you, if you are serious, Anonymous, and I know you're not Anonymous, we did chat over email, so I hope you're watching. Why shouldn't you be afraid of the basilisk in my estimation? Well... In my estimation, this idea is generalizable to be a very um, faith-based argument. Um, and not faith in the religious sense, more like you have to assume without evidence something is likely to happen. Right? The definition of faith is belief without evidence. Um, or what I would consider scientific evidence in this case. So, for the basilisk to become real, you have to take a couple of things on faith. You have to first assume that humanity can get to the point where it creates hyper or, or super intelligent or rapidly increasing intel in intelligence, artificial intelligence, so that we can achieve super intelligence. We cross the singularity barrier and we create something that is so much more intelligent than us that we are like ants to it, neurologically in comparison. You have to assume we can do that. Why I'm not afraid of the basilisk part one or A is that I'm not convinced humanity will get to that technological place. Heck, we might, depends on, depending on what happens in a few weeks, who knows what's gonna happen, okay? Two, you have to take on faith that the situation that I presented, that the basilisk will want to torture for all eternity those who didn't help it come into existence, you have to take it on faith that that is a viable program for it to run. 
amongst the trillions of possible programs. So we are focusing down on one that is very scary, but we're not assigning a likelihood to it. It could be incredibly unlikely or so unlikely that you'd have to take it on faith that it could happen. Okay. So given these two articles of faith that you have to take without evidence, the argument that you should be very, that you should morally be very afraid of the basilisk is, is not a good argument. To me, faith-based arguments, if we're talking about what is the likelihood of something happening or what should I do in my life, Believing something without evidence is not a good argument. At least it's not going to convince me. So why I'm not afraid of the basilisk is because, like the simulation argument, that has a lot of things that you have to assume to be true, or could be true first, I don't think what you have to take on faith is very likely. Um, and as literally tens of thousands of comments have also pointed out, and I'm not going to be explicit here because I'm just a science boy. I don't have an axe to grind about this specifically. But you can extend this reasoning out to a lot of other ideas that require a lot of belief without evidence. And if you do that, and if you have a certain opinion about those things, then you can extend it to this too. Like... For example, you could, you, I could argue that if you don't start building a monument to Thor, you will be shocked on your butt for eternity. And I could, I could start saying some very convincing things from that mythology. And there is some likelihood basically zero, that it could be true. But it's it, this is interchangeable. The basilisk is just a technological version of that kind of faith-based logical reasoning, if you can call it that. So um, I'm not afraid of it because I do not think the antecedents of the argument are very likely. So I hope that makes you feel a little bit better. And trust me, I made the video. If I... I wouldn't, if it was really that bad, or I, th or I honestly thought it would be that bad, I wouldn't have made it. I ain't gonna do that to you. Uh, Kane Clampett uh, says what a number of people say as well. Ro uh, Roko's Basilisk is just a sci-fi version of Pascal's Wager. Yes. Um, and I should note, if, you, if you're seeing messages uh, disappear or get deleted... That's because I have my security team in the chat. They are my faithful bucket and baton wielding security team. If you're saying anything weird or controversial um, or intentionally aggravating in the chat, you get banned. That's just how it happens. And and where do all these people come from? Well, they come from the facility. If you want to join, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill. If you do that, you get access to behind the scenes content, episodes early. You get to uh, send me episode ideas. You get to see my new kitten and uh, you get to join our Discord, where over 800 people are in there talking with me every day um, and getting uh, private live streams, not like that. And my security team came straight from there. And like I said, Dr. Beef carries a baton, it's big, and Dr. Tactical Bucket, you don't want to see that bucket. It's the last thing you'll ever see. Um... We have Chris Spaghetti again with the five. It says, search elect electromagnetic propulsion engine third video on YouTube. I just wanted validation for someone who understands physics. Um, I can't do that live right now, Chris, um, but I will look into it. I promise. Scout's honor. I was a Boy Scout. Uh, Immortal again with another five. Enough about time travel theories and paradoxes. How would you travel to another universe, assuming that multiverse exists? All hail the basilisk! Well, again... Assuming that different universes exist. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, fine. If, let's take the bubble universe theory, that there's a universe and a universe, and it's embedded in some larger, you know, dimensional kind of thing. Here's the main impractica problem. 
right now we wouldn't be able to travel to even the next star in a single human lifetime. To travel to the edge of the universe with current technology would take however many years, billions, trillions, whatever it is. Uh, well, I mean, if the observable universe, if the, uh, if it's, you know, 13 billion years away, light years away, then you can assume it's going to take some order of magnitude more than thir uh, you know, 10 billion years. And that's just the observable universe. The edge of the universe, we suspect, is now racing away from us at faster than the speed of light because it, it can expand into nothingness. So even if you get, even if you could get to the edge of the universe, the universe edge would always outrun you, and you would never get to another universe. Or not, I don't know. <laughs> Andrew Holcomb with the ten, who says, "Have you ever heard of a Tesla turbine? If so, what are your thoughts? I first heard about them a couple days ago. And they are interesting. No, I have not, but I will use your simping to look them up. Let's pause the super chats for just a second, so we can get to our third uh, third topic, which is a fun, which is a really fun one. Some of the, the coolest footage I've seen in a while. Uh, Stefan Thompson with the five says, "Hey Kyle, love the hair. Oh, you mean this old thing? Out of curiosity." If triangles are the strongest shape, why don't we build triangular homes and buildings? Um, I would say this to you, my good man. Have you ever looked at a bridge? Bridges have to be strong, right? Or else a lot of people in cars drown. You ever look at a bridge and you see all of those triangles and what we call trusses? So you see triangular shapes all along in between big steel beams? That's right there, my man. Dylan C. with the 20 says, Would it be possible if everything balanced out with gravity for a planet or other object to have faces and vertices to be somewhat of a rectangular polygon? Regular polygon. Yes, anything that is small enough such that it won't, it won't form a planetoid. And um, this is around like 200 kilometers in radius or so. Um, if something is small enough, gravity is not strong enough to, in, to overcome the internal forces of the material. Once something gets so big, even like something like, you know, a uh, rock, the gravity pulling in that rock when it's the size of a planet is stronger. That pulling force is stronger than the forces holding that rock together. And so it starts to become more liquid and form into a sphere. So if you had anything that is uh, very small, you know, it could still be like the size of a city, but it could be in a rectangular shape. That's why a Borg cube would work. Oh, 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 you see that? You see that comparison I just made? Like, I am, if you think about, like, just how much... I'm on a boat. <laughs> uh, so, I'm on a boat. But I'm, a, I'm on a boat upside down. What's going on? Well, what's going on is a very cool physics uh, theory and experiment called this, floating under a levitating liquid. So this is indeed upside down. So I'm upside down. How? So beyond that, I'm floating upside down in a levitating liquid this below me right here is liquid floating in a tube and this or, or little thing and it's not this is not a snapshot this levitating layer of fluid stays there how well one of the most interesting ways we've ever seen is what we're going to look at and if you wanted to levitate a fluid let's say in a cylinder. How would you go about doing that? Oh, 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 how? I'm in a little boat. Well, above my head and below for you is some air, right? And below me is also some air. So we have liquid with air on both sides of it. Okay. That still looks like the snapshot, Kyle. What are you talking about? Well, if we get very clever with our physics, we could come up with a solution to levitate liquid. What if we shook this cylinder really hard? <laughs> if we shook it really hard and at the right frequency, 
Wait, which which way am I? Then above me, the oscillations would be pushing against that water, creating pressure waves that would come to my boat and press on the water. And similarly, below me, for the top, for you, that oscillation of the top of the canister or cylinder or whatever would be pressing so fast and so hard that the air pressure, like a piston, would keep all of the water inside of that vessel from coming down to the, to the top or the bottom. So let's see how this works in situ. How cool is that? <laughs> so that is liquid in a shake table. Look at that, two layers. So this is slowed down, of course, but if you shake it at the right frequency, you can you can get a as as this uh, bespectacled man is showing you. You can get a levitating layer of liquid that sits that can sit on both the top and the bottom. Well, uh, so so you have two layers of this suspended liquid, two surfaces that you can interact with. And so what I want to show you specifically is my little boat. This is the counterintuitive part. To me, gravity is pulling this way. I should fall down, but I don't. Why? Why? Think about it. What this is showing is that even without gravity helping, well, gravity is helping. Here, here. Scratch that. Reverse it. So if you look at the, the boat below me, it is experiencing a force pulling downwards from gravity, but also a force pushing upwards that we call buoyancy. When those two forces balance out is how high the boat or whatever other thing that's going to float sits in the water. But sitting in my little boat now, you can see that there's some kind of reversal going on. There's still a balance of forces, but gravity still pulling me down. Is buoyancy pushing me up? Right? So now we have a reversal of the balance of forces showing that you can have buoyancy if water was suspended on the ceiling. You could still float upside down, which sounds so weird and looks so interesting to me. And this is something that you can only figure out if you actually do the science, of course, which these scientists did. That was called dead air. I was reading some comments. <laughs> that being said, isn't this cool? Let's get back to you. Boise free runner. I said it right that time. You, how dare you? Ooh, uh, some of my invisible cup stuff spilled on my hair. I knew it. Boise with the ten. It says, if we built an evenly dense and rigid brid, bridge perfectly around the equator, would it need to support? Would it need supports to the ground? Um, if it's around the Earth, it would be pulled down in all directions and cancel out and float, right? There's a Vsauce video on this. I would I would suggest for you to look up because I don't have 30 minutes to go on tangents. <laughs> uh, where it's like, uh, could you put a rope around the world or something like that? And that will answer your question. Uh, Untertang, 1987, says, this reminds me of the third... Pirates of the Caribbean movie, <laughs> Sundown to Rise Up. Oh man, let's pause the super chats for just a second, so we, because we're all, we've been talking a long time. Let's pause the super chats for a second, so we can get to our last two topics. But Sierra O'Neill with the hundred dollar donation, Kyle, I absolutely love the show. Thank you so much. I hope I pronounced your first name correctly, Kyle. I absolutely love the show. I had a question earlier in the day, but I've since forgotten it. I'm sure I'll remember that the instant the live stream ends. If I do, I'll write it down for next week. In the meantime, keep up the amazing work and hashtag simp for science. Thank you so much, Ciaran, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. That is a very cool name. And thank you so much for the donation. That will help 
that will help cover the cost of the two and a half thousand neodymium magnets that are shipping to me from overseas for reasons yet to be seen. Gabriel Zacco with the ARS 50 says, simping for science from Argentina, baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. That how you do it? I don't know. Ghost of Recon with the 10 who says, I wonder if this would be a re re yeah. I wonder if this would be repeatable if the fluid had a very low surface tension. Uh yeah, that was more gooey. That wasn't like water water, so I don't know. Uh let's pause the chats for a second and let's get to uh Dylan with the 10 who says, Show the love, Kyle. Hey, what's one of your favorite spicy plays on in magic? Get back on game nights. Um well, uh, one of my favorite recent spicy plays was uh, in my Narset deck, I cast Expropriate for free, and every player at the table had a Rhystic study, So, and they all gave me uh, the option of choosing money instead of time, so I had four Rhystic studies and an extra turn. That was disgusting. But you know what's not disgusting? Whatever this next topic is. Oh, Siren, it's Kieran. Kieran, thank you for the... Thank you for the huge donation. Peer review. Peer review is the part of the show where I take one of your comments from a previous episode of the facility. In this case, I made a uranium cloud chamber at home for under under 100 bucks, which I think is pretty awesome in terms of something you can do at home. And uh, I take that comment. I highlight it uh, if it was interesting or, or thought-provoking or controversial to me, said I was wrong or something. I highlight it, and then I give that person a plaque as they become an honorary member of, this, of the facility. And today I'm giving it to Allie Finley, who says, reenacting what it must have been like when I bought a aquarium for an for an, uh, for a uranium cloud chamber. Pet store clerk, what kind of pet are you building this habitat for? Me? What do you mean, pet? Now I wanted to say this because this happened. I want to highlight this because this happened. <laughs> so I went to this pet store. It was a family-run pet store. Um guy and his wife and his kids running around. And first of all, I love going in pet stores with no intention of buying any pets. I love looking at the snacks. I love looking at the little blue tongue skinks, little geckos, little frog boys that look like jelly beans stuck on a wall. Stuck on a wall. Oh, I, I regularly, as a kid, ask my mom to take me to exotic pet stores. It was like, it was like me going to Disneyland or, or the equivalent. I was a very, I've, I've always loved reptiles. I've owned a couple reptiles in my life. Um, it was like a pastime for me. My, my, my childhood was collecting bugs in the backyard, looking at pond water for little organisms, uh, going to museums, checking out my dinosaur CD-ROM for the thousandth time, and then asking you to go to pet stores to look at the snakes. Could have been a biologist. But with this hair and this economy? <laughs> um... So I say all that to say this, Allie. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I bought the, I bought the fish tank, and um, I went to the clerk and I said, "Hey, can you, like, would it, how easy would it be to cut out the top of this and replace it with a metal sheet?" And they're like, oh, "I mean, I, I, I guess you could do that. What are you putting in there?" I was like, "Uranium." What? Why? Oh, you know, it's gonna put in there and see the radiation and stuff. Okay, that will be thirty-two twenty-nine. I like. Actually, I just filmed something on Sunday. That was really, really hard physically, which you will see. Oh, it's gonna be a big one. And I liked interacting with people. I like interacting with people when you're doing science that's both silly and informative. Or like, why are you doing this? What do you What are you doing this time? They really um. It's becoming slowly a part of facility branding. Like, did what? Chain whip? Drowning machine? Uranium? Oh, wait to see what we got coming up. So for making me tell that little story and, and revealing that I'm, in fact, a lizard person, not like that. Ellie Finley, you are indeed an honorary member of the facility. <laughs> ah! Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, so this is the point where you're supposed to get the plaque, but, um, we don't really have the, 
the plot. Just, I. We'll be right back after these short messages. Yes, of course. No, everything's going perfectly according to plan. Yeah, that person should be afraid, of course. Every single view during this live stream, every single cent sinking through science goes towards your vacation, almighty man. Yeah, no, I'm working on the scale. It's hard to get that much carbon fiber. Yeah, you're gonna look like a Lamborghini, and it's gonna be sick. Just chill out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just... Trying to manage expectations, you know, <laughs> project manager and all. And... Okay, yeah, 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 I'll make sure you. I don't know, like. 20 bucks at a time, I mean, that's like half the scale, right? Well then. Okay, I'm sorry. I love you too. Mars! Moving right along to our next topic because we've been chatting for a while. Ooh, I might be lagging a little bit, but we're gonna deal with it. Uh, before we move on, the Ryshanic with 20 says, had a crappy day, here's 20, make me feel better. Makes me feel better to give you money to make the world a better place, Sim for Science. Well, that's very kind of you. Let, I'll, here, this next, I'll try to make you feel better. With Mars. So uh, to close out office hours this week, let's talk about that study that came out saying that there's possibly uh, subsurface lakes on Mars. Why this is so interesting is that, of course, if there's liquid water stuff on any planet, that gives us some hope that there might be life there. It's not to say that life can't exist in some other way, but since we only know Earth life, and we know Earth life can be in water, when we find large bodies of water, they're interesting because ipso facto, life, water, you know, you get it. So what happened to find these? Well, uh, a satellite or, or a detector orbiting Mars, what this study was, was using that orbiter to shoot down radiation in the form of waves. Sonar, was it? Radar. What was it? <laughs> anyway, it shot radiation, and I think it was radio. Doesn't really matter. What's cool is that you can take something above a planet, shoot it into a planet, and then tell what is in that planet or what that planet is made up of without ever setting robotic hand or foot on it. How you do that is... You, you shoot this radiation at whatever you're trying to look at, and then you look for the reflected radiation that comes back. The way the radiation changes, does it, you know, um, amplitude, frequency, what happens to it as it goes through the surface and then back. If you do enough science, you look at, you know, uh, samples here on Earth, geology, you shoot stuff at that, look at that. Once you have enough science about how radiation change indicates different materials or different thicknesses and densities, then you can shoot it at a planet like Mars and get an idea of what is below what you see, how Mars is made up. And so the cool thing here is that upon, they went back to a site in 2018 where they thought they had uh, discovered some of this radiation change, some of those reflected waves that could indicate something like water. Now, if it was water, it would have to be very, very salty. Why? Well, it's not James Charles on the internet. That'd be too salty even for Mars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm up on the tea. Uh, or Tati. I hate that I know all that. Don't you dare get on camera. No, don't show them my subscriptions. <laughs> what? Oh. Water on Mars is hard. Why? Well, Mars has basically no atmosphere. And with no atmosphere, there's no atmospheric pressure. Without pressure, water will boil away very, very quickly. Uh, for the same reason why water will boil more easily at the top of Mount Everest or in Denver, Colorado, it's because there's less pressure pressing down on the water. And so 
extend that outwards. When there's zero pressure, the water will just <sighs> become steam or, or sublimate. No, evaporate. Uh, and so water on the surface of Mars would just evaporate away. But also, Mars has a basically dead core. And this dead core means no magnetosphere, which means if you go live on Mars, you're going to be irradiated pretty quick. Beside the point. It's more or less dead inside, like millennials. <laughs> which means there's not a lot of heat in the planet radiating out slowly to the rest of the planet. So one, solu so one way liquid water could exist under the surface is that if it were salty, that would lower the freezing, the freezing point such that it could be colder without becoming ice. And you know, briny water can get colder. This is the same uh, reason why, you know, throwing ice in the sidewalk keeps, it turns the ice on your sidewalk into water. It's because the same temperature is not cold enough to freeze it. We're learning so much today. So they went back and they looked at a site from 2018 that looked like it had this possibly briny, salty water. Five times, in fact, five times saltier than the sea. And again, that's not even as salty as James Charles on the internet. <laughs> Anyone else see his post about on, at Coachella? I mean, right? He's a millionaire. I know, what am I talking about? So they went back to the site in 2018. They looked at the place. They, they replicated the study in 2018. They found the same evidence. And then they found a couple of uh, evidence of a couple other possible salty water areas. Um, so that in itself is fun and interesting. That not only did we replicate a study, but that... But that... Uh, sorry, I was getting a phone call from... What? I'm, I'm live. Well, yeah, I mean, I was trying to find a good carbon fiber guy. No. <laughs> yeah, they have no idea. I <laughs> love you. <laughs> Stupid watch. Um, so they found more possible spots of this water, which means more possible spots to look for life on Mars. Cool. However, scientists disagree that this could actually be water. It could also just be a sludge, a slurry of kind of liquid, hyper salty, not as salty as James Charles and Tati, but hyper salty stuff that life wouldn't, as we know it, would not be able to exist in. So this is a cool study. Shows that there could be water underneath the surface. We have some evidence to indicate that it could be that and life could be there. But this, again, like most studies you see these days, this is just the first step, like the phosphine on Venus possibly indicating life. This is the first step. More science is needed. Before we end everything, let's go to you one more time. So we have Patricio Noremuenas with uh, the CLP 10,000. Oh, I bet that's not as much as I think it is. Kyle Show, love the hay. Greetings from Chile. Doctor Who did an episode of Water on Mars. Doctor Who did a lot of cool stuff. I won't say, I won't go through all of everything that he did, or they did, the writers did, but one of the episodes, like having the long ship with one end much closer to a black hole than the other and having one part of the ship age differently than the other people on the ship, that's a cool idea. Silvos with the 10 says, what happens when an unstoppable bucket meets an unmovable cow? Uh, they pass through each other. We have Biker Bones with a 10. It says, if many worlds is true, wouldn't that mean there's a universe where we find out how to contact all other universes? No. Multiple universe theory, or many worlds theory, if there's an infinite number of possible circumstances for everything, that only includes circumstances that are physically possible. And so it could be the case where contacting other universes is physically impossible and therefore it would not happen in any of the possible universes. As always, we have Music Central Piano at the end of the stream with a 51-51. Ah! 
Is keep up the great work, Kyle. Stay rational, curious, and safe. Don't worry. I have I have so many masks hanging right up by my door. I wonder, do you do the same thing? I sprayed them with Febreze, too, because I'm sick of my own face. Also, what are Kevin's facility credentials? It seems like he may have just wandered in unharmed and found a role as, quote, the Kevin. Um, his... Uh, that's classified. It's so classified, Kevin doesn't even know what his classification is. Do you, buddy? <laughs> Don't you dare get on camera. I'm just kidding. I'm not. Uh, so... With that, it looks like a, oh, one more time, Master of All. Tw let's pause the super chat so we can we can we can bring this baby home here. Master of All, frequent frequent supporter commenter, twelve ninety four with the A five. It says showing up at the end of the stream again. Sup, Kyle. Sup, Master of All. What do I have to tell you? I mean, there's nothing more I can tell you. You're the master of everything. So thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Office Hours. What do we go through? We learned a lot today about wormholes. I hope how I described that study was at least intelligible, but it showed a possible mathematical, logical way out of the grandfather po paradox, which is very interesting. Uh, we talked about the basilisk uh, and why you shouldn't be afraid of it. We also talked about buoyancy, upside down kind of anti-gravity ships i love the footage of that is just so dang cool we also talked about me going to a pet store and trying to explain explain uranium to a nice family they seemed like they didn't know whether or not they should call somebody and finally we talked about finding possibly liquid water on mars that possibly might have life on it or it could just be as salty as james charles on instagram <laughs> there's no way to tell the former the latter is easily identifiable. And rounding everything out, we have Lightning Ninja. Oh, you better make this good. Lightning Ninja Two with the ten. If a chunk of the moon was taken out of the if a chunk of the moon was taken out of the moon and pulverized and formed a ring, would it form around the moon or Earth? Um. So there's a thing called the Roche limit that says how close an orbiting body has to be to be pulled apart pulled apart by tidal forces, and depending on the mass of that body, that uh, limit might be so close to the body that the rings won't uh, form and crash into the body instead. So you'd have to look into the Roche limit. Thank you everyone so much for watching. Again, if you want to get facility merch, if you want to join me and the security team in the chat almost every single day on Discord, if you want episodes a day early, if you want to see pictures of my new kitten, if you want to give me episode suggestions, if you want once a month members only live streams from me, not like that, but sometimes like that then you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and join the facility today. I hope to one day see you there. If not, that's totally fine. What I care about is educating you. So have a wonderful rest of your week. This, ep uh, this week's episode, it's going to be a fun one where I try to interpret some pop culture thing that I have never interacted with before. And it has math, so that's fun. Have a wonderful rest of your week and be nice to each other, especially in these days and in the coming weeks. Oh, please be nice to each other, because this, things outside might change, but we, well, what we can have with each other hopefully will not. Now that's a bad way to close out. That wasn't even cool.